Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining this session. So as mentioned, this will be a controlled, safe environment, centralizing the voices of the speakers. Please keep your microphones and your videos switched off. I'm just going to give a short introduction to what this discussion is and what it sets out to achieve. This is an online panel discussion sharing the realities of anti-blackness within West Asia, North Africa and its diaspora. The work of anti-racism activism and information does not lay on the shoulders of the black community. However, it is so important to ensure black voices from within West Asia, North Africa and its diaspora are heard, seen and given a safe space to express lived experiences and for non-black people from the region and its diaspora to acknowledge these realities and commit to anti-racism work, not as a self-improvement exercise, but to use our privilege to actively challenge anti-black racism in every aspect of our lives. I'm now going to pass you on to our incredible speakers who will introduce themselves and firstly to our official moderator, Rayanne El Nayal, who is a British Sudanese artist and architectural designer. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alia. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rayanne Nail. I'll be moderating this session. Um, and firstly, I just want to introduce you to the amazing panel we have here today. Um, so I'm going to start with Sarah. Sarah Ali is a culture and communication expert in the business of luxury with 25 years experience in African and Arabian market trends and consumer behavior. Sarah's clients have included the two royal households, Harvey Nichols, Sir David Ajay, and many more. She's won national awards for her mentoring and sustainability achievements and is based in London. And next, I want to introduce Hal Del Bey, who is a Sudanese artist, political cartoonist, illustrator, designer, and, write and writer. Um, he's the founder also of uh, Get Fada and Doha. Doha Fashion Fridays, which you can find on, on Instagram. Um, and next, I want to introduce OT. Um, Omar Tom, commonly known as OT, is an entrepreneur, strategic planner, educator, and public speaker. OT is a co founder and partner at Dukan Media, a marketing and cultural consultancy known in the industry as the leader in contemporary Middle Eastern culture. And next, I want to introduce Ola, who is a UK based stand up comedian an NHS health professional. Next, I want to introduce Rami, Rami Dawood, who's a Sudanese American rapper and actor born in Alexandria, Egypt. He immigrated to the United States in 99 and settled in Kansas City. With the, with the traditional Nubian and Sudanese songs that he listened to growing up and the new textures of music he discovered living in Yes, he began writing his own songs during his adolescence and recently had a um, he collaborated with Odyssey, um, and I think you can find the song up on, on Spotify. Lilith <laughs> is a Cameroonian Kuwaiti actor and theatre maker. Um, her screen credits include the amazing Netflix hit show um, The Witcher, um, and Domina on Sky at Atlantic and Doctors BBC on the BBC. She has also worked with many theatres and companies, including Shakespeare's Globe, uh, Globe Theatre. Um, in her own work as a theatre maker, Colette is currently developing Dreamer, a semi autobiographical solo piece that explores the experience of Black Arab women and how issues of race, gender, and sexuality manifest in modern Arab society. And honestly, Colette, I love, I love the work you do. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of the stuff that you do, and I've seen um, the video that you recently had um, done with Asia. Um, and yeah, I think you're incredible. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you to, to the Perfect whole panel. Thank you. We just wanted to say that this is kind of um, an open discussion. Um, and this is a virtual session that kind of invites um, the panel um, of Afro Arabs or Africans um, kind of exposed to Arab media and the Arab region to express their opinions and their experiences. Um, as people who may have been victims of, of anti-blackness in the Middle East and in the WANA region. So I'm just going to kind of like open the floor to, to, to discussing anti-blackness in the WANA region. 
um, and you guys' uh, experiences. For me, I kind of, I think this session is very important because it's dealing with the denial um, that we have in the Arab region. Um, I believe the Black Lives Matter movement is very different. It differs from um, what's happening in the West and, and the dynamics of it is very different. Um, and so this is what this is all about, um, shedding light on that. I just wanted to say something before you continue, Riam. I just wanted to thank you for bringing this together. This is a conversation that I've really been so keen to be part of because I don't know about everybody else, but for the last month or so, constantly talking about race when this isn't actually part of my job description um, is exhausting. And it's just so refreshing to be amongst my colleagues, my peers and really my truly my brothers and sisters here this is a, this conversation has a different feeling for me because i don't have to explain yeah. what is race what is white supremacy it's just there's already i feel this is starting off on a different tangent and that's already refreshing so thank you for this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. don't thank you think you. isn't it so exhausting Thanks, all the time? just explaining yeah. <laughs> We are too Arab to be African and we are too African to be Arab Absolutely. and we're sitting in this middle ground <laughs> and it's not easy. <laughs> I think yeah. as well when we talk about the, the black experience on the, on the international plat platform globally, like what happens is, is that we often reflect on the British, uh, the black British experience or the uh, black American, African American experience. And we kind of, because our issues are, we haven't, we haven't really had many conversations or collected ourselves or uh, came, came, come together like this. We haven't come together like this in the past that what happens is, is that we're disconnected from the rest of the, of the diaspora. And so um, I see people, people's passionate responses to uh, the murder of George Floyd. Um, but what happens is, is that what ha uh, in our region, there's a lot of passion and disconnection by, by, by thinking this is happening in the West and this is not us. And all of the different injustices um, and the daily experiences in our uh, part of the world gets lost. Mm -hmm. So true. So true. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Have you guys had a look at the George Floyd hashtag, how it's been trending in English and Arabic? I have not. Could you expand no. on that? Sure. So I, I, um, I've been monitoring this from the beginning, from just from the point of view, sort of crowdsourcing information. That's my main interest in this. But I found in any given day in English, it would trend about three and a half million times on average. And in Arabic, is the hashtag George Floyd in Arabic 11 and a half thousand times only and you know, you're making this face but if you actually went and look because i'm actually following the tag most of the time it's been used as clickbait to shift mm. stock it looks like a toys r us store and this is mm. something that no one's discussing and it's like i don't know what do you guys think of that it just <laughs> i think it's important uh Ryan said uh what did she say she said this is she hinted that this is just in the beginning. Of denial, the word she used was denial. And as someone who has lived in Egypt and in the United States, I find that the topic of anti-blackness or racism in the Arab world is, it seems like it's in the baby stages for people to even understand how, how damaging this idea is. Right? While in the West, I feel like it's, it, it's talked about it's uh, people, people tackle it from a, even a political aspect. In the Arab world, it's so ingrained in, in the media and we see it in movies and such. And it feels like it's just now we're beginning to talk about it on a, on a more, like on a broad scale. Yeah, but we're still being shamed about talking about it, you know? It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, what I find is that people are very quick to um, accuse uh, anyone who talks out about it uh, of speaking out against their, their countries. So it turns into a conversation of like, I don't know, like patriotism rather than what the, the actual focus is. And I think that that, I mean, I, I recently read the book, uh, White Fragility, and I'd seen all of these tactics of, you know, just, diverting from the actual conversation that we're 
are having. And there is this huge thing about uh, investigating, analyzing ourselves. We need not to be um, scared um, of analyzing ourselves and viewing it as a criticism, but rather an investigation so that we can improve. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. Um, the reason why I think discussions on this kind of dynamic is so important because actually we have anti-blackness in our own black Arab communities. Absolutely. So, um, for example, in Sudan, we have a huge bleaching epidemic. Um, and so, and though we are victims of anti-blackness, it is, it is really something that we, a discussion that we need to start at home. Um, and especially within our own communities. Um, and I don't, at the moment, I think it's not helping when people are pointing the finger at what's happening in the West and saying, oh, but look at police brutality over there. No, 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 we don't have anything like mm. this over here. We don't have it over there, but we have news presenters that have their faces three, four shades lighter than the rest of their bodies. <laughs> no one wants to talk about. Do yeah. we not see that? I mean, we're like, I don't know what they're talking about, but it's on our own screens. It's ridiculous and it's embarrassing. Like Sudan is a country that I am proud. To, <laughs> you're laughing. I'm mm -hmm. so proud to represent Sudan on in all the work that I do. But you know, in another side, I'm like, come on, people, this is this is ridiculous you know this is we are better than this so that I want the best of Sudan to be represented if you're a, a newsreader for Sudan television you're a, a brand ambassador for a very intelligent country full of lots of very qualified people but we turn the blind eye to something like that and then you know and I'm aware that I'm light-skinned talking about this conversation but look it's I'm the same color everywhere <laughs> um, but, <laughs> disclaimer um but you know i i work with luxury brands and you know just going back to blackout tuesday i work with a particular brand that you know they declared themselves um you know black lives matter you know the same brand selling um suntan lotion to a western market is selling bleach mm. to their asian and their middle east market and you know for me to sort of bring that out, I need the support of my community to say, we will not have this. Yeah. But I have a lot of people say, Sarah, don't do that because then it's going to go in the black market, <laughs> black market, and the prices are going to triple and you're only going to be able to get it in certain pharmacies in Paris. So it's like, we, wow. we have to, we have to be okay with ourselves and we can't talk about reparations and we can't talk about black lives matter really, unless we're okay with being black ourselves. And, in Sudan, we have problems admitting that we are black, and it's yeah, it's it's a problem. Mm. Even though Sudan itself means land of the blacks, it's kind of ironic. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't historically. They didn't want that name. There's a lot of. Uh, but if you look of, at the history yeah. of that, even before it was called Sudan in Arabic, literally all the names of what today we call Sudan in all the different languages that have passed through the region has always meant land of the blacks. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's a, it's, it's um, Sudan in itself, like in, in North Africa, for example, if you say I'm from Sudan, yeah, I, I went to Morocco once and I was talking to this guy and he said, you know, where are you from? I was like, I'm from Sudan. He's like, which Sudan? So anything from our wow. Sudan to Mauritania, that's Sudan. Yeah. Anything like the region. Have, yeah, that's, that's Sudan, all of it. And even, even, even until, until the, the, the independence of Sudan, Chad was called French Sudan. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, Chad was called French right. Sudan, uh, Mauritania, Senegal. That's that's West Sudan. So yeah. it's this is this this whole region is called Sudan, you know. Yeah. So it's it's a Lia Arda Sud, well, all of all of this stuff. But it's um, it's um, um, yeah. I mean, we I, we we definitely have an, an issue with ourselves and our blackness and and what it means. And and it's really funny because you know, for I, I think for me personally, like when when I left Sudan, I was what 13, 13 yeah, 13 years old or 14 years old. And in Sudan, of course, you know, we're the privileged ones, you know, we're like, we're like the, we're the Arab, whatever, you know, like middle class and all of that. And, and, um, and I see it, I see the, 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 and I grew up with that. I grew up with the casual racism. That's like, that's how it is, you know? Every day. So yeah, that's how it is. That, that's just how it is. You know, these, you know, we're not supposed to mix and this is this and this is that and everything, you know? So when I when I went when I when I went to uh, when I went to Doha when I 
when, when we arrived there. And then I was suddenly the oppressed, you know, from being the oppressor, basically, I was suddenly <laughs> oppressed. It, it really opened a lot of doors for me because now you, now you see how it's like, right? So mm. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like, okay, so now I, now I understand what it means and why this is wrong and why, why we shouldn't talk like that. But for a lot of people that didn't uh, experience that, that didn't experience being on, on the oppressed side, they wouldn't understand it. You know, it's like whether it's white people in, I don't know, Kansas or whether it's like, you know, uh, uh, Sudanese in Shimali or whatever, because they think of themselves like, you know, we did, we, you know, we do what right. we, we do what we do. And we uh, that's that's how that's how things are. And we're doing our best. Like, what else do they want from us? You know, it's um, that thing. Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, go ahead. And also, like you know, with, with the with the whole police brutality, I hated that conversation because, like, oh no, no, but this is this is police brutality. Look what ha was happening in America. You guys, you just you guys are just trying to copy, right? What's going on? This is a thing, and yeah, it is a thing. But it's time to talk about it. But it's also talking about police brutality. Even in Sudan, what's our biggest issue? Was police brutality? Beut al Ashbah. Al Darib Darfur. That was that was mm. ten years ago. That's police brutality. Yeah. Exactly. So, like, what are you talking about? Of course, this is, we have police that are against you know, uh, 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 you know, African African tribes or 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 darker skin. That it's it's exactly the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just about about just changing the white, you know, the 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 whole white mentality into us that we are doing the same thing. You know, yeah. and that's what a lot of people don't 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 want to understand. You know, and I, yeah. I have I have really good friends, really educated friends. Until today, when they when when they're talking, they say it. they say they say the word and I'm like, why why are you saying that? You know, and they're like, ah, they still oh, yeah. they until today, and these are educated people, mm -hmm. educated mm -hmm. people that I called friends. You know. Now they don't know to talk to me like that, but like it's 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 uh, that's that's how it is, unfortunately, you know. <laughs> and we, had, yeah. we had presidents that that think the same way. We had the longest war in Africa because of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say it's, that... it's interesting how you said it's so adi, right? It's so normalized when you are the oppressor to use this language, right? Yeah. I think another thing we have to look at, look at is how damaging it is that when, when you're not born into the class of the you know the the, the oppressive class or whatever right yeah. and you are born into the oppressed class how normalized it is to think, think that, that it's okay, okay to be called these things so for, for example, example like i wasn't raised in sudan i was born in egypt and i lived there until we went to the united states and so when i was in egypt not only was i a sudanese right a non-egyptian in egypt i was also a nubian and they are native Egyptian Nubians who are also oppressed. So it was like, I have those two things. And we would get called things like barbarians and um, Bawabin, Khadami, these kind of things. And as a child, I thought it was normal to be called these things. And I feel like that's very damaging as well. So we might, we have to kind of put ourselves in, uh, in the shoes of those that are oppressed, whether it's in Sudan or wherever in the region. And think how damaging it is to be born into that, and think and accept these words, yeah. these damaging words that you know we call or we get called. Yeah. It was it like, was really it was really funny when I went to. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, I was just gonna, I was just gonna jump in and add to that because, like, similarly, obviously, I was I was born in Sudan, from Medini, but then like couple of months later, we moved. Like, my dad wasn't even in Sudan at the time, so I didn't really know it or grew up in, in Sudan in that way, mostly grew up out here. And, you know, as, as you start to develop, especially in your adolescence, like you're, you're getting engaged in a lot of racial confrontation in school. And as kids, you get into fights and get arguments and like witnessing and experiencing that from a very young age. And then you go to Sudan and you realize this, the, you're on the other side of the scale where you are the effective, right? That's talking about obviously the issues that were with with the South and you know and hearing the language that is being used by you know people at home, my grandparents, you know my parents sometimes or even uncles and aunts like this, del mazayna wa tarda and you know these points coming to surface and then I remember I got I got disciplined for saying but we're black though by my oh. grandmother and no la right. 
And, it, and I remember there was this confusion of the, I'm arguing and fighting for my sudanese on both ends, but two very different fights. Yeah. We're here, it's, I'm, I'm fighting against these comments and point arguments of, you know, you guys are black, but then I'm trying to convince my family there that, that that's how they see us. But they, I think to your point, Khaled, like, unless they've lived it, they won't understand being from an oppressor and oppressed on the other side of the coin, where it's like, no, you're completely treated completely different and you're seen very differently. And I remember like, you know, talk, try and talk to my parents about that as a kid. And they're like, um, then, you know, uh, you should be, you should be confident and proud of who you are. You, you know, the, these narratives come to life and this idea of like, you know, you know, you know, you know, that type of talk. I'm like, I, I mean, I get that, but everybody else doesn't because I'm dealing with two very different narratives, right? You know, you're, you know, from one side oppressed on the other. And then that kind of confusion from a very young age kind of, and I feel like, um, and I've spoken to a lot of friends who, you know, were the raised in a DCC where suddenly you want to move away completely from this identity at some point because you're like, I don't get it anymore. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if this is me. I, like, where do I belong in this entire equation? Right? Because in Sudan, we're like, we're treating other Africans one way. But then I come here, it doesn't matter. I am African just like everybody else. And then, mm. So you're, yeah. you're constantly on this upscale balance that you're trying to figure out. And I think that confusion resulted in you know at, at a young age there's a sense of loathing and as you get older you want to be more patriotic and you want to fight for it because that's what I saw and and I've shared this story frequently where like I think a lot of us assimilated and, and Rami I feel like maybe you might have a you know a point of view on this as well but it's like why I gravitated towards hip-hop culture because I saw people around me would watch yeah. music videos or tv shows and like yeah. they glorify those persons they saw on TV, but then La Etels or I don't know what, right? So like two very different narratives about the same thing. And that added to the confusion. So like, okay, you know, kind of start gravitating towards that because I want to, I want to talk about me like that. I want to feel like that. Yeah. Yeah. And and that was another point of translation. So it's always this um, sense of like trying to identify and figure it out. But like, I also feel like, I believe that I feel in a way, grateful that we're the first ones to openly talk about this. Um, except, I feel like our parents and grandparents accepted the normalization of these things. Yeah. And we're like, okay, no, no, no. Something needs to change somewhere. And we're finally having these conversations quite openly about that. Yeah. Yeah. I just okay. want to um, yeah. come into your po- point, OT, and also uh, connected to police brutality. The thing mm-hmm. is, um, br- police brutality is in a response to trying to control that, pr- that pride that people have within themselves that say our lives matter, you know? And mm-hmm. I feel like the reason okay so we always talk about police brutality not happening in our region of the world and the thing is is that we so successfully our psyche is not at the place not in the same place that the west is as a collective as a people so in 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 so many ways is that we are still in the stages where where we are policing ourselves so there isn't that kind of resistance that um that needs that that creates a fight against you know all someone has to say is you know one of these derogatory racial slurs and that you know just completely silences us you know and we are not backed by one another in moments like this so many so many times have have i experienced uh uh like just in just encounters with people that are absolutely horrible and thinking that my you know uh my people, my brothers and sisters alongside me who are present for these moments will stand up for me as well. But it affects us in our psyche in different degrees. And that means when these things happen, that we're not able to unite and fight back as a, as a, like a strong front, you know, we can't, we don't, we are still in the, in the process of, of, you know, coming together and standing up for one another, you know? So, 
th there is that. And another thing about, um, you know, wanting to be like looking to, you know, rap culture and hip hop and all of that. It's the same in, in the GCC, especially in Kuwait, you know, after the Gulf War, there was a lot of uh, black Americans that were in Kuwait, a lot of the American culture that got adopted to Kuwait. So suddenly everybody was wearing baggy pants, fubu, you know, like flat caps and all that stuff. And people are like, that's awesome. My sister was saying to me the other day that the nineties was the best time to live because everybody wanted to be black, you know? Yeah. And I was saying to her, I was just like, and for us, we gravitated towards that because subconsciously there was a pride. So if they mistake me as black American, they celebrate me. But if they see me- You saw as your likeness. A, yes. And if they see me from within them, then I'm a direct threat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to what you're saying there, Colette, I mean, I grew up um, heavily influenced by hip hop, but then also watching the Cosby show. And so being Sudanese, is there's, there's a part of me that felt like I was that Cosby girl, but then I wanted to follow Aaliyah, Missy Elliott and run DMC. And so, you know, even at a very young age, you know, my parents coming into the room, if I'm watching the Cosby show, they'll poke their head in and out and it's fine. If I'm watching, you know, MTV, your rap, uh, your MTV rap set, you know, mm. Five Five Freddy, it's like, what are you doing? It's like, I'm, le I'm learning to, to, um, I don't know, to rebel, you know, I'm yeah. learning to speak up, I'm learning some swag, you know, I'm like, well, yeah, I am. But then also at the same time, um, I have other challenges in my work at the moment where I'm often the only person of color in a boardroom. And the first question, nobody else gets this question, we sit down, where are you from? Like, like why are you asking me where I'm from? Like, yes. is this gonna affect the menu? Are you gonna, are we going <laughs> holidays? Is this good? You know, why do you need to know where I'm from? So I have this conversation as diluted as I can hold it without offending people for their ignorance because I live in London and we're an island. So everybody here came from somewhere, right? Yeah. So I usually deflect it by saying, Oh, you know, I'm I live in London. I'm from Sudan, and they're like, oh, you're not Sudanese. I'm like, yes, but I am. Thank yeah. you. Um, you know, it goes, <laughs> Thank it, you. It goes through, yeah. You know, and then but then I go to Sudan, and then the first question is like, it's a bit mino, it's a bit yeah. when, and you're like, uh, mm. what is this? It, I think mm -hmm. it's a curiosity. People want to know, and sometimes it come can come off in a way that's, uh, you know, like where are you from? Almost feels like where are you? When are you going back? You know, it, yeah. it doesn't, there's unease about it. But I can't, again, hold this conversation in the Western community when we have this as well. We have this ranking system mm -hmm. waiting for us coming, you know, they, you know, they, people just want to, to put you in a box and we need to break out of that and, and exactly. understand that we need to do our own work. The same mm -hmm. work that's in White Fragility and, you know, um, all these other books that, you know, everybody's reading at the moment. We have our own homework to do, but their books aren't written. No one's writing books about this. No. You know, no. I've, re I've read Leila Saeed's book. I've just, you know, all of them. And it's, it's uh, white Negroes, a, a lot of them. And I'm, I can relate to this, I can relate to this, but like in who is telling our story in an authentic way that's holding us accountable, but yet holding us proud because we're all incredibly mm -hmm. proud, but we yeah. just need to stop waiting for this colonial wave. You know, we have a uh, Western certificates that have helped all of us here in this panel yeah. have yeah. this conversation and in English, you know, and which is great yeah. for us, but then, we, we need to understand that with that privilege comes a responsibility and, and we can't duck out of this conversation anymore. We really can't. Mm -hmm. so, it's so important yeah. though because it's really? like it, it sometimes I feel like the conversation is that we've got a we can't we can't do both we can't the re, the problem right now is that the west are so far ahead that sometimes within us we are so desperate to already be there that we are <laughs> starting to have a conversation like this but then the conversation becomes okay but we need to deal with ourselves so my question to all of you is that uh, how do we how do we how do we fight both fights you know because i can't for me i feel very impatient about waiting 
by the time that we're on the same page as a majority to actually have the conversations that we're having right now and being able to, uh, you know, stop blackface in the media, for example, mm. stop uh, put down I humor. Etc. Mm. Yeah. So f for me personally, um, I think the issue is growing up, we're told by different people what we are. We mm. don't know what we are. So we get, I don't know. So I grew up in Portsmouth. So I grew up in a majority white um, city or town or whatever. But we also had a lot of Arab students, Arab families coming to settle here to do their masters, their PhDs. So when we were growing up for four years, um, I think most people in the UK know that we go to normal school and then like on weekends or evenings, we'd go to an Islamic school. So the Islamic school I went to was a Saudi Arabian school. And even though there's racism in the UK standard, whatever, I never in a million years thought I would go to an Islamic school and experience racism from other Muslims. Never, mm. ever, 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 okay. ever. Okay. So, and it wasn't just like, and the thing is i never really got it my dad ended up pulling us out but it was like silly things like um the kids used to leave me a bag of um peanuts on my desk wow. and i didn't get it Crazy. like I, I genuinely didn't get it i love peanuts i took it as a compliment <laughs> like i didn't get it um and they used to like use words that i never like understood like i always tell rami wakhir wakhir I never knew what that meant, but they used to always say it to me. And it means Move. like, get out or something yeah. like that. Move. I don't think. Mm. Yeah. So growing up in kind of white society, when I tell people I'm from Sudan, they would regard me as black. So that's how I've been raised. I just thought I was black African. And until now, I identify as that. I would I'll never, never identify, identify as Arab. Because, because when I went to an Arabic school, they also didn't identify me as an Arab. Mm -hmm. ever they never made me feel like I was included in that so when I went to Sudan like when I was older properly in 2001 the way that some people would refer to West Sudanese Kiskin Sudanese they were like they'll be like and I'm like who are you talking to am I adopted like I'd never got it. So you've got white people telling you you're black. You've got mm. Arab people telling you you're black. And you've got your own family telling you you're Arab. Yeah. Yes. So you're so lost in translation. It yeah. seems like we're the only people that are telling ourselves they're Arab, but the rest of the world is telling you you're a black African. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a big disconnect. I think there's a big disconnect. Um for example, like my family in Sudan would always ask me like what life is like in America. And when I tell them about police brutality against black people, and then when I tell them that I face, you know, some of these dangers, like I get pulled over for no reason. Uh when I go shopping, I get followed around by security. They, it's almost like they can't believe it, or they refuse to believe it. Mm -hmm. And I had this older guy in my family, and he was like, he laughed at the end. He goes, ha, 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 ittu hinak sood, like, in fi Sudan, nihna al And I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, no. <laughs> that's, that's not, but it's just like, there's, there's a big disconnect. And whether we like it or not, I feel like it's up to us to kind of connect those two um, parts of us. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm interested in in obviously anti-blackness in in places like Sudan leads to kind of almost like a national identity crisis, right? Where everyone feels like they're still having to choose whether they're African or Arab, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. is fine. But I'm I've never been to Kuwait, Kuwait. Kuwait. and I'm interested in your perspective because um, I guess in a way you end up having to kind of automatically become an activist when really if you are if you are an actor why can't you just be an actor like at the same time Absolutely. you know you feel the responsibility but you know you should be allowed to be Kuwaiti whatever you want to be and an actor at the same time without yeah. having to so I'm interested in your perspective and in how how that affects um your identity in Kuwait 
It affects my identity greatly because I am in a unique position in that my mother is the Kuwaiti and often that's seen as the wrong way around, right? You are considered Kuwaiti if your father is Kuwaiti. And even then they might say that you might have a couple of whispers of sentiments of you not being, but if, you're, if your father is, then that is not to be heard out loud. But if your mother is Kuwaiti, I mean, till now, uh, right as we are speaking, you know, there's a lot of conversation going on about women, Kuwaiti women still not being able to nationalize their own children, you know. Right. So it just shows you the balance of power uh, between the two, gen the, the, the two genders, not that the only two genders exist, in my opinion, um, in my belief. But my experience was that I never felt that I was able to be to claim no matter if I was if, if if everyone it was general knowledge that I was that my mother was Kuwaiti people were still surprised people that I had been in class with for forever whenever I turn around they would be like whoa wait a second where is this coming from I'm like on you know I've been with you guys since the beginning how are you still surprised that I speak Arabic and the thing is that there's a separation between the community, between those who look more East African, who are accepted as, um, as uh, within the, 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 more accepted, I should say, as, as Arab in, in Kuwait, than if you were to have a features like mine that are seen more West African. And it's the more African you look, the less you are of us, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was really difficult. And I find that when I was seeking to have jobs in the in television and in on stage, it was very much that I had to accept that the roles were other. So I had to be the khadame, or I had to be oh you know, anybody that's other. So Great. even though I'm born and raised and at that time had not been to Cameroon at all, I don't speak French. And my family that I know are all Kuwaiti, all Arabic speaking, all uh, like conservative looking. I, I can't, I can't even claim it. I, I can't claim it. I'm shamed and I, I am, I'm bashed for thinking that I am a representation of uh, Arabia or Black Arabia. Crazy. Mm. So that's, I have that's to actually be an insane. activist because I have to, you know, and it sucks that I have to be, but I think about, you know, I, I have to keep fighting for myself and other people who look like me because it, it, for a long time, even after I left, I only called myself Cameroonian. And it hurts because when I go to, you know, uh, the, the African community here and other Cameroonians, yeah, mama, I'm not, we uh, are home, you know, I don't have the same culture. I don't have the same uh, language, uh, you know, like I don't have the same accent. And although I can appreciate that half of me is part of them, I do come to the culture as a visitor, you know? Mm. So, mm. unfortunately, and, and when I look, when I source from my work, you know, as an artist, you will all know, being in creative fields, that you want to make work that resonates with the deepest parts of you. And if you can't claim the deepest parts of you, you end up with the most shallow like art that you can find. It just That's doesn't, right. you, you can't keep creating from that space. So now when I made Dreamer, I had to, I had to claim that part of me and show our stories and all of the conversations now that we're all having, you know, because I cannot, continue to let them shame me out of uh and robbing me really out of my history and my birthright that's yeah. crazy yeah it's that's actually insane mm. growing it's up just... you know growing up in the in the in the gcc it's it's amazing to me even like at at this time now yani fil yom al watani fi 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 doha uh يعني like the the usual you know the dance the sword dance and stuff right yeah, yeah. and and there's a and there's a, a there's a black tribe and we all know there's not a black tribe who are you lying to you know and they had to like dress up and do the arda and shit and everybody's like well why are you doing this you know yeah. and and it's it, it's really shameful that they have to put on this parade right just to feel like they feel like they belong you know, and in, in, and and even now they're not talking about it. Like the whole world is talking about this whole issue. Nobody's talking about it. In Qatar, there's a slavery museum, 
and it yes. talks about and that's like one of the first things that you know it's 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 I, you know, I'm, I'm i'm very proud of that work and uh it went on like it has a lot of it has a lot of uh uh you know um testimonials and stuff and everything but it it our people are very sensitive about even mentioning talking about that you know no, no, no we're all the same we're all the same nothing's happening yeah, no, don't, 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 don't don't talk about that so it's really it's i, I think it's really the it's, it's the time and for the gcc to really talk about this you know i mean it, in kuwait it's uh it's it's a lot more open actually you know than than anywhere else in uh then yeah in, in in the gcc so it's um yeah and but that, sorry yeah sorry. no it's just sorry. i was just i was just i was just trying to talk about the the um um uh, i forgot don't worry go ahead <laughs> <laughs> i was just gonna say that even when the middle east recognizes race they skip us and they go again for black westerners yeah. you know it's like you know it's a great creative campaign to bring in you know hollywood to dubai or saudi arabia wants to elevate itself now to be global and you know uh, they have their own campaign for tourist reasons but i don't want to get into that but why do they skip over black arabs and go straight for you know black westerners you know um i have conversations again with the vogue arabia and you know they put black models on their covers but then they're not telling the narrative you know my my um my interest is in that model when she leaves you know dxb how does she feel hailing a taxi how is she checking into her hotel can she get her foundation and this is again talking from the model's experience how is she ordering her food how is room service coming to her had she not been a guest of vogue arabia's and again you know when you put the likes of lupinda um young on the on the cover of another arabic magazine are we aspiring to this conversation because the women buying these magazines as they're flicking through them they're having completely different conversations and why is that it's because we keep putting expats in senior positions in the middle east to speak for the creative industry when we we know what we need you know, we, we're, we're black and we're Arab. We're, we can be either whistleblowers for both sides or an asset for both sides. And we are, you know, dual culture, dual language, dual everything. You know, we, we're the Swiss army knife of what you need to get done in that, you know, North Africa and the Middle East. You know, especially with the Sudanese community, I see so many doctors, architects, designers, Matrice, models. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal in terms of the proportion of Sudanese there are to the creative output coming out of this country. Mm -hmm. But yet, no, when you want to hire, go and hire from Hollywood, go and hire from London. And that's completely frustrating to me because, you know, why would you do that when I can speak Arabic already and I can tell you, I can help you train you for the job that you already have. If you will listen to me and I will help you earn more money if you can see where your Western lens is making you feel like because you're an expat, not immigrant. And that's something else that absolutely makes my blood boil is that, mm. you know, when we leave our countries and we go elsewhere, we're immigrants. But when Westerners come, you know, to our regions, you know, they're expats, they're guests, the youth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we treat them as their youth. But when it mm -hmm. comes the other way around, we're constantly proving that we got to our seat on our merit with our certificate and our yeah. culture and and the tariqatna we adabna we bit our tongues when we needed to speak and we spoke up for our brothers and sisters homa they don't have to deal with all of this so why is it the creative industry has so many um non arabs full stop non black yeah it's a it's a it's a known thing like every, everybody not only the gcc anywhere you go yeah and yeah, it's sometimes at work and whether it's in 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 doha whether it was you know in dubai back in the day or whatever when i'm when, you know when i'm talking or i'm, I'm having a conversation with someone yeah and especially yeah, from like the local community whatever it don't have to be and they say oh so uh which state are you from yeah i'm like actually i'm from sudan 
crazy. Oh, and you can see the disappointment in their face. Like, and, man, I wish it all the time. And the narrative changes. <laughs> yeah, you're the like, changes after that. you're talking like you're yeah, intelligent yeah. to me, right? Like you're a white person. You're yeah. that. Yeah. You know? It's like, yeah. you, can, you can tell. Well, like, yeah, and I got so many, I got so many jobs just lying my head off. Like, I was just like, yeah, you know, I basically went to America. I, like, I, first time I've been to America was, I don't know, like six or seven years ago. Right. Yeah. But I, I've learned that I have to look a certain way and talk a certain way for, for people, yeah. for people to, I get a reaction from people. Like I cannot be someone that works in, works in the creative field, someone that's, that's uh, uh, successful without me being from the West. Like it just, it doesn't, right. they can't comprehend it. Like how, how yeah. are you doing this? They can't you know? yeah. this, you. They can't. Yeah, that's that's the the when you it's, go and work in America and come back, then the Khalid are going to respect the fact that you went all the way there and they loved your work and you came back and you got to hey, tell your why, why do you why yeah, do you think I'm in Denmark right now? Sorry, didn't say that again. The, 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 whoever. No, you were saying how they would appreciate him more because he went to America and then came back. Well, yeah, you yeah, no, the opportunity to come long, amongst them right then and there. Uh, no, no, no. As long as white yeah. people, white people think you're good, then you're good. And this is basically how my career, my whole career went. You know, like yeah. right. I went, I basically had my portfolio, and I went around to newspapers begging them for work, right? And nobody gave a shit, right? Yeah. Three years later on, I the New York Times does a profile on my work, right? Yeah. Now, I'm I'm the best. Like this guy's like, oh, you know, this, uh, the Arab, whatever, you know, and the, you know, and I was like, dude, you've seen my work. I came with my work to you, you know, yeah. you, yeah. nothing, you know, none of that, mm -hmm. does, that doesn't count because now New York Times said you're good. So you are good. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. It is a post-colonial post PTSD that, 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 that we have here of like, oh, the Khawaja Ahsan, right? And I think coupled with that is also, there's a sense of like, um, a denial of what has happened or what it's like like we don't want to like nobody wants to accept putting up a mirror to ourselves and like let's look at that and this is what i felt here i mean it's very i think your story Khaled, anybody that was in the gcc at any point has experienced it yeah. in some way or the other right because like for me especially in the advertising industry where when i stepped into it here sudanese were a minority i mean just black people in general were a minority and then sudanese are this even smaller minority in the industry and like and i knew we knew we all knew each other even though we worked at competing agencies and businesses and it was one of those things where like at first it's it's not about it's not about the merit of your work like it's, it's what you look like first and oh what language you speak and then like uh let's see what kind of work that you you produce and I was rejected from a lot of different opportunities. And then not until I went to the US and I was like, oh, I went to Miami ad school and I came back with this new American certificate and I worked in the US, the narrative changed. And I was approached and treated very differently. And like, and I don't forget, once I came back, um, I was working in one of those big network agencies and my, my mom calls me, I'm in the elevator. And like, this girl shrieks. And it wow. like shriek like she like some like she saw like something happened she shrieked and she's like oh my god like that that line oh my god. and i was like that, I was like, that yeah, line yeah. oh my god that line <laughs> that's and it i was like oh. <laughs> that's it right? and i was like yeah i'm sudanese mm. and you know, the treatment after that point we're like oh okay everything changes after that and it was like it was just that moment where you really like do I need to be here? And and I and I spoke about this a lot. I was like, that was the driver why I started the can the the can show when I started the podcast. I was like, well, my I don't have my likeness in Arabic media, right? Like at the time, this Sudanese diaspora third culture kid, whatever we want to call it, um, we we look nothing like what's in Sudanese media. But then there was no representation of Middle Eastern Arab media or you know, in, in the GCC, and then. In Western media, the whole other case, like we just we were not looking good at all. <laughs> so the driver was like, "Okay, well, I'm gonna create the idea was to eventually to create something that you know what, I'm just gonna speak for myself at this point because trying to get this with anybody's not working out. Nobody's gonna help. So I had to create it from scratch, build the foundation and the building blocks one step at a time for myself, and find people that were like-minded that could be part of this growth and development and like." And not until I did that, and I was like, okay, now I'm starting to understand what I'm doing with it. And it was these conversations with people that helped navigate that. And then it was this, and then it became, well, 
it's the voice of the others, the voice of the marginalized, okay. that have been sidelined, that have been not accepted by a society or community for whatever reason. And then that became a point of like, okay, this is us. At least for me, I can be very honest here. I can be very vulnerable. I can tell the story like it is. And I can talk about these experiences, you know, whereas, and then the next day you show up at work again, and I'm like, oh, the heck out of it. I'm like, see, that's a little, I ain't about to be it. <laughs> but it's also, it's also our problem, you know? It's also that it we don't, as you said, like we don't, there's no representation of us. So how do they know about us, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, you know, put yourself on that oppressor, put the oppressor hat on. You're like, how, do, how am I supposed to know? How am I supposed to know anything about Sudan when there's nothing out there about Sudan, right? Except mm-hmm. for uh, Nasser al-Qasabi. ولا ال 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 كويتيين بيعملوا بلاك فيس ولا الإيجيبشنز البواب في 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 المسلسل. There's nothing out there. We're not putting out mm-hmm. any media that says who we are. You know, mm-hmm. and 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 a huge part of that as well is our government. A huge part of you know, not getting accepted into jobs and all of that and being treated that that, that way. Besides عقدة الخواجة حقتهم, إنه إحنا our education went crap. Even though the people that built the GCC are Arab, like Sudanese. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, yeah the I want to. The gatekeepers are white. Mm-hmm. Gate, uh, or sh- shall I say light uh, light Arabs? So yeah. for no, us even to white, create even white, even white, even white yes. Yeah. But for us to be able to put our 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 stories and our you know like our culture out there, we have to be accepted into those spaces. And we're yeah. not standing at the doors and we're letting each mm-hmm. other in. That's not no. what's happening right now. No. No. No, but, and, and the thing is, the thing is, Khalid, in the, we are part of the fabric. We've been part of the fabric. For this thing of like they don't know anything about us, for me, it doesn't stand anymore. Mm. right mm. you didn't ask anything it's not for me to teach you everything about me i've been here right yeah and i've yeah. been operating and i can yeah. see other people are operating Ka, Al-Hain, we're looking at each other look at all of the work that we've done just us yeah. right and we're not all that there is for for them to turn around and says no i don't know mashuv it doesn't stand for me like mm. you have to That's put true. in the work too this is a 50 50 right mm. so, they don't have a reason to though that's the they thing don't. they live they live they live in a small place and they just they don't care like i'm going about my business this is this is this is how things are right now mm-hmm. i don't care but I, I for me it's all about shoving it in your face like we have to be there and that's that's how it is this is how the un changes things you know like this is the the, the whole about you know the whole whitewashing look at you know if you look at the reverse of that we, you know, we're the, all the history that we know is, is is bullshit because this is what we were told, right? Yeah. If we shove it in their face, this is who we are. This is what we do, and it's a law, right? That you have to have a black. the carton is the lion. You guys seen that? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and it has yeah. all the all the characters <laughs> from different from the, the different Arab world, and uh, and and the, yeah, there's a, there's a Sudan in there, though, which is which, and he's not black. Right, I was like, oh, that's, wow. that's, that's a start. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's th- things are happening because now our generation, people that grew up with that, people that you know, the third culture kids, and and that's and I think for me that's a huge part of why the revolution happened and succeeded was because the people in the West, yani, or or outside of Sudan, know their power now, right? So we have people in the UN. We have yeah. people in whatever, like, yeah. you know, that, that can speak to power now in the way that power understands it, which is sadly white power, right? But they know, we know how to get to people. So I think now our generation, exactly like what you said, it's like we, they have to do their part of the work now, but we also need to work Keep really hard. Keep shoving it in their face. That, yeah. that, that, as black people, we have to work harder. That's like, that's, um, the, that's I think I want to touch on two points, one that Khalid made and one that um, OT made. So um, I was just reflecting on it and um, I didn't watch a lot of Arabic TV, but in like 1999, we got the dish. (laughs) We got to watch um, like lots of like Arabic TV. And um, so some of the ones I used to watch in the 2000s, so just like how in the UK or in America, like on TV, they'll have the criminal as being black. They'll have the terrorist as being Arab or whatever. Mm -hmm. I feel like in Arabic TV, they have the same about us. So you'd watch like Tash Madash and uh, the Awir, the loud one yeah, the, yeah. would be Sudanese black face. And a few years ago, um, one of my friends was on Arabs Got Talent. And another guy who was Sudanese auditioned for it. 
So obviously me, I was really excited. So he came on the stage singing Ya'ni Hadi Sudaniya, spoke to the judges. And do you know what his talent was? Uh, he played the harmonica with his nose. And for me, I was like, why did you put him on that? And so people were like, oh, who's Do you know what? Did you give that image? The, my friend who was on um, Arab, Arabs Got Talent, um, she was from the uh, band, uh, Salutia Ben Nord. And they performed the Sudanese song. They ended up going out in the second round because they told them, don't sing Sudanese song, sing an Arabic song. So it caused a divide. They ended up singing Bob Marley. Okay. And it's like, I felt that if you don't represent yourself the way we want you to represent yourself, Basically, they want, do you know what, it's because I can hear the echoes, because I'm sitting next to you, isn't it, Rami? I think that's what it is. <laughs> and I can hear my own voice, and then it's annoying me. Um, the, the second thing is, in regards to OT, what he was saying, in 2014, I was encouraged, because I just did my master's um, in cardiology, and I wanted to get a job in Fil Khalid, yani. So I wrote my CV and I wrote in ethnicity, I put Sudanese. So when I went out to apply, they were like, it was quite difficult to get a job, but the pay wasn't how I was thought it was. People were telling me, oh, if you go to Al Khalid, you get paid 30,000 pounds tax free, blah, blah, blah. They were offering me like 12, 13,000. Yeah, you can't even live on the salary that they offer. Uh, uh, black people mm -hmm. in the GCC. Yep. Ma Anna, I classified myself as Sudanese. That's what yeah. I thought if they meant. No, if you had put down British, would it be different? Ma, Absolutely. One of my dad's yeah. friends, yeah. who Khalid, he's from Dubai, and he's a consultant radiologist. So he went through my CV because I wanted to apply to military hospitals. La manshafa na katabta Sudaniya. He was like, Ya Biti, what are you doing? <laughs> You're British. Yeah. So I changed my um, ethnicity to British. And the job, wages, double, tripled. Yeah. And wallahi al azim, purely based on this, I was like, I can't work here. Yeah. Because I'm not going to have my British passport stuck to my forehead. When I'm walking through the streets, people are going to know I'm Sudanese. My mm -hmm. patients will know I'm Sudanese. I don't look white. Mm -hmm. What again? What upsets me, and it shouldn't be about religion, but I thought, as a Muslim, I would be respected and appreciated more. Wow, you really don't know the golf. Well, I don't know the golf. I know, but even though being amongst white people. I know what they're, all, know thinking, what they're all thinking, but because, but because I'm educated, because, because I, I'm, I work, work really, really hard, hard they, they respect I'm me. I'm really struggling to hear you, honey. Yeah. Yeah. They respect me for what, what I, do. I do. And, and people have pushed me. They were like, oh, there's a there's comedy, comedy uh, circuit, circuit called, called Comedy Arabia. People are like, oh, oh really, why don't you apply to it? Why don't you apply to it? But I, I would never, I, I personally, from my experience in 2014, I don't think I, w I ever would. Because with white people like i can go on stage and completely like use my platform about my experience of racism from them and white people will laugh and they will take it mm -hmm. so if i make a comment like um so you, you might have all heard of shamima begum the bengali mm -hmm. isis thingy my opening mm -hmm. line because a lot of my audience are white people. So my opening line is, um, I really enjoy comedy. And this is the first time so many white people looking at me with smiles on their faces. The last time I saw this many white people smiling at a girl with a hijab on is when they refused to let Shimima Begum back into the country. Mm. Uh, so they wow. know what I mean, and mm. they would laugh, but mm. they will kind of have that kind of expression like, yeah, we'll take that, we'll take that, because they acknowledge it. Mm. I don't think I would be able to do the same comedy talking about our oppression to them. I don't think Ever they would appreciate mm. it. No. So that's why I feel like I could never do comedy unless I have like certain 
you know, omit certain things and kind of manipulate my comedy to suit them, I don't think, yeah, I don't think I could be me to an Arab audience. So that's what, that's why I don't think I'd be able to perform as a comedian in the Middle East. Yeah. What's so upsetting about that is that you think, you think because you're um you know black and, and Again, it, arabian you can speak the arabic language no wow well, me being sudanese <laughs> would be an advantage at least i can speak both the english and arabic language mm -hmm. i'm both british and sudanese and african i have this insight like sarah you're saying that's so valuable but actually they'd rather just put all of that aside the fact yeah. that you talk to them in arabic the fact that you have insight and can understand their language yeah and still just you know um, per, and just, sometimes it's really microaggression. Sorry, I, I interrupted you, Liam. No, no, it's all right. Yeah, go. It, it's yeah. the microaggression that uh, uh, upsets me. Oh, yeah. And I think that one thing that we can do collectively as one is, um, you know, you know, we're talking about anti-blackness here, and that's fine in that we all stand united and we have the same opinion. But there's a problem when we start. Um, dissecting this conversation about what we each do to each other and then there's colorism and then there's sexism um, I want to see the black Arab man start to view his woman his daughter his mother mm. his grandmother as beautiful and I'm and I'm talking from the point of view um, not just as a visual um, way of saying you know i see you i hear you i feel you but you know i i work with, in the fashion industry and i work with culture and 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 other aspects of where i'm dealing with prod products and consumptions so going back to the skin bleaching going back to the hair extensions going back to the eyelashes and the nails and the cosmetic surgery this is all growing in sudan whilst we're mm. sitting here going oh we're so proud to be sudanese these markets are blowing up and they're in closed facebook groups and they're very um, intelligent, articulate women who are trying to beautify themselves so the Sudanese man, the North African man, the GCC black Arab man can see her as, uh, as something to be um, seen. And it's not about just the women wanting to be seen by the man. It's just, I'm saying, let's, let's just agree that we're going to stop aspiring to something that... A Eurocentric standard of beauty. Mm. European, yeah, it's not just the, the, the beauty from the visual point, because when you see somebody and I, you say, I see you with your hijab, with your nose wider, with your lips fuller, you're acknowledging that they even exist. And this is the same, well, this is what we want from, from white people, this is what we want from Arabs. Well, let's do it for ourselves before we mm. start expecting other people to do them. And the West is talking about reparations and so forth. We're not there yet. We're, yeah. we're not there because there's shame in our conversation. So let's let's go like reverse, go back to basics and, and actually start having these conversations with our children and also with our parents and grandparents. So then we can take an honest look um, at this mirror that I'm talking about, you not just for the, the visuals, but for be going beyond skin deep. I deal with foundation and I deal with bleaching and, and all of that is frivolous. But what that says is you're not good enough so we need yeah. to start being good enough for ourselves and the way yeah. men treat women it, it's it's something that needs to be discussed too yeah. I think you're right in saying that you have to do it within your own families. Um, my mum called me uh, one time and she was like, Ali, you feel in Sudan, you know, you can't talk about it, you can't talk about it, blah, 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 blah. And she came down and there was a woman like educating about using natural products to make your skin nicer. She was like, you see, Ula, this is the way you can talk about it, you can talk about it, you can talk about it. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, Dizata Fasha. Zara Aleha Fasha. Exactly. Exactly. So she's there educating people on not bleaching their skin and using herbal remedies when it is evident that she's bleaching herself. So um, I think it does start with us. I from what I've seen, this Black Lives movement has made, in my opinion, a big difference. Because believe mm -hmm. it or not, there's Sudanese people who were born and raised in this country who are skin bleaching. Mm -hmm. uh, fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this Black Lives movement has Shueya shown them that, okay, being looking Arab is not the in thing at the moment. Being black is actually the in thing. So I feel like they're grasping that. Maybe one day there's going to be an Arab's Lives Matter and they're going to go back to it again. 
But, but they, don't now, want, they don't want that, Ola. They, you get arrested if you demonstrate Black Lives Matter in a lot of Arab countries. You and get your Africa, hey. You get arrested. And you we, get threatened that, especially in the GCC, that your nationality will get stripped from you. And they're using if I'm not COVID, mistaken, that's they, the threat. The, the, the threat. Collect is absolutely right. And they're using COVID as an, as an excuse to keep everybody, you know, social distancing. But what yeah. they want is to social distance away from the conversation about race. Absolutely. And what I was talking about, men and women, it's not because I aspire to looking beautiful for a man. It's because it affects marriage. It affects relationships. Yeah. It yeah. affects, you know, oh, look at their children. Their hair is so loose. You know, mm. you've gone from a type four hair to a type two. So you're evolving and moving forward. No, we need to stop these conversations in our homes yeah. so that mm. we can have better quality conversations that are to the level of our intellect. Because I, I, when I see fellow Afro-Arabs, I am constantly learning. This, is the, this, this panel this afternoon, with all due respect to my previous conversations, they don't touch on this. Mm. I'm learning from you guys when normally I'm like, well, white supremacy is this. And, you know, and the, you know, <laughs> you're just like, us, I, you, let's move on from this conversation. We're always centering white people on something that they can do for themselves. And now this conversation, I'm learning from I'm like, you too, you've heard this too. And I've never known that. Mm. This is, this mm -hmm. is really something. Mm -hmm. and let's not pretend that you know, like there's a lot of strategic, okay, so we lighten our skin to be more uh, seen as beautiful and, uh, and, um, and be an ideal partner. But mm -hmm. then you have genetics and you have children who will end up being, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Of your hue, part of your hue anyway. So right. it's just like, who are we tricking? We are tricking ourselves because, Mm -hmm. whatever you do to your skin today oh. does not mean that your genetics suddenly change and That's you're suddenly true. a light Arab or white. It doesn't work that way. And then your child has to deal with the same thing that you avoided by lightening your skin and, you know, living a different mentality, you know? And it's just exactly like, I have to raise an issue about the Me Too movement as well, because, um, it's very we as you've said Sarah that all of this is interconnected you know mm -hmm. and my fear about the Me Too movement coming to Arabia and us doing this performative dance of like you know yeah us where we're we're now we're coming out and I have to say Sudan and, and Egypt have been spearheading the women in Sudan and Egypt have been spearheading the conversation in the region but yeah. my thing is that the black Arab woman is the least valued person in Arabia yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we are always targeted to sexual abuse. We are seen mm -hmm. as disposable parts, the disposable people. We're not even humanized in our community. So when boys are being allowed to do whatever they want, e ah, they let him go out and have fun. He has to experience and they're having their experimental mm -hmm. sexual experiences. They cannot go to, uh, you know, this girl that belongs to this family who is light Arab and all of that. Who do they go to? Us. Mm -hmm. And then we can't go to the police because they don't see us as valued parts of the, of the society to fight on our behalfs. If we are going yeah. to people who have the mentality, in na zift, then how, what the hell are we supposed to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Me Too right. movement for me, when I see the helplines, I was like, these helplines are for white Arabs. They're for light-skinned Arabs. Mm. And it's us performing to the world. It does not apply to us. I'm sorry. But we have to target first the mentality of the people who are surrounding us, the people who are, are taking care of legislations and everything, like in the judges, the courts and whatever, and then within our own family. So we stopped being shamed in the first place about even using these helplines. There's so many barriers. So they many actually barriers. take the details. If you phone and they, you, you know, this is the, the I've had a lot of um, work with the anti-slavery um, group about something like this. And what they said is that when, you, when they have people calling in, they, they actually, they start tagging them. They start monitoring them. If you phone, they, they keep your number and they start with the, with the app monitoring your movement. 
So the same technology that the, the wider community is talking about, let's keep an eye on COVID. Oh, you know, you can wait, download this, that, whatever. The same technology is being used to monitor these women, 17 years old, 27 years old, and some even in their 50s to see where they're moving. Because then, then if something happens, you out. say, why did you leave your house? Yeah, yeah.